All right, guys, welcome to something a little bit different on the channel, and welcome to anyone new around here as well. I hope you are all all right. Now, I know I'm a little bit late to the party, but I just want to wish you all a very happy new year. Hope you all had a wonderful time bringing in the new year with your friends and family. I've got a feeling that this one's going to be our best one yet. So, the point of this video, I'm going to be making a list of games that I've played this year, and I'm going to be putting them in order from worst to best. So... You can skip ahead if you want, just to... I'll put timestamps in the description, um, so you can go through each one if you want to do it that way. The only thing I will say is you're going to miss a lot of context if you don't listen to this first part, because I'm going to tell you what the factors were that influenced me decisions. So feel free to do whatever you like, guys. Completely your choice. I'm happy. Um, so, I'm not counting games from our sub-suggests or our community choice series. And I'm not counting anything that I've played for the first time this year. So like Resident Evil Village or Detroit Become Human, just to use a couple of examples there. So it's purely just the new releases that have came out this year that I've played here on my YouTube channel. Now that means if you've came here looking for Baldur's Gate 3, which is the actual official game of the year, you won't find it because I didn't play it. I can appreciate it from afar. It's just not my type of game, unfortunately. So, just for context, these are some of the factors that influenced me decisions. Number one, how much I actually enjoyed the game. So, I think this is the most important one, because obviously this is my opinion. And if I didn't really enjoy a game that much, it's going to impact my overall experience of playing it. So, I think that one's pretty straightforward. Number two, the gameplay slash performance. Now, this one can go either way, and what I mean by that is... A game could have really good gameplay, but it could have performance issues, but it could be that good that it carries it through it and it doesn't really impact your experience. And I've got examples of that coming up. Um, and then, I mean, if it goes the other way and it's like it's got bad gameplay and bad performance or bad gameplay and good performance, it's not going to really affect your experience that much because if it's not got... The gameplay is obviously key. And if you're not enjoying the gameplay, it doesn't really matter how that performs. So... That one doesn't really, on the other end of the scale, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But there are games where they can be really like top tier gameplay and still have those performance issues, but it doesn't make that much of a difference. Number three, um, whether it's a franchise game. So what I mean by that is if I've played a game this year and there's a few in this list that are part of a franchise and I'm a fan of that franchise, then... I'm just naturally going to lean more towards that game because I have the connection to it and it will, unfortunately, it will impact how I feel about it. But at the end of the day, this is my opinion. So I need to keep reiterating that point that this is my opinion. And then point number four, which I also think is the least important. So how easy the Platinum was. Now, as I say, I don't think this is that major and I've not put games in over others solely because the Platinum was easier. And a great example I can use of that is something like Red Dead 2. Like, that's one of my favourite games ever. And I didn't platinum Red Dead 2 because the platinum was such a massive chew on to get. But that took literally nothing away from how I would rate that game. Whereas on the other hand, if I didn't enjoy a game and then the platinum was also terrible, that is going to impact how I feel about the game, unfortunately. Because I don't want to grind for a platinum in a game that I don't even enjoy to begin with. Or I'm not too keen on. So, as I say, that's not really that big of a defining factor. But it's still a factor regardless. Right, just before we move on to the actual list. I want to give some honourable mentions. Because I feel like these games deserve a little bit of spotlight this year. So first off, we've got Horizon Forbidden West. The Burning Shores DLC. Now, I really, really enjoyed that, but obviously I'm not counting it because it's not a full game. So I just thought I wanted to give it a mention because that was really fantastic. It was a great addition to the already great game. Right, this next one's a little bit controversial because it kind of is and it isn't. So we've got the Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty DLC slash expansion. Um, so I do think this one's kind of a 50-50 opinion to whether or not it should be classed as a full game or not. Because really they did overhaul the entire thing and built it back from the ground up. Um, so I'm not mad if anyone did want to put that as a full game or what. But I didn't. I just didn't think it was right to put that in there. Because I mean Cyberpunk had been out for like four years or something. So I just didn't think it was right to put that in. But it does deserve 
acknowledging because that DLC or expansion, whatever we're calling it, did contribute to the immense resurgence of this game. The attitudes towards this game since it released has just done a complete U-turn and now it is so beloved and it deserves it because I loved Cyberpunk when it first released, when it was terrible. And that was going back to what I was saying about the factors, about the gameplay and then the performance and all them things. A bad performance sometimes doesn't hinder a good game and that's how I felt about Cyberpunk even though it was filled with bugs and some of them were like game crashing level and all that stuff I still loved the game so if anything that shows that I'm not biased and stuff like that so yeah I, I did want to give Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty a mention because it was really really good all those endings incredible like it's so heavy hard hitting everything it was great honestly if you've never played Cyberpunk yet or you've been holding off go and do it now it is incredible and finally, we've got the most recent one, the God of War Ragnarok Valhalla DLC. Now, this deserves a, a shout-out because I, we didn't even know this was coming for starters, and then all of a sudden Santa Monica dropped this on us at the Game Awards and gave us it for free, which is not to be understated. That was a great gesture from them. Um, yeah, this DLC was just fantastic. And one thing I did forget to say is all these honourable mentions as well, I have also played these three on my channel, which is why I've brought them up. I just felt like they deserved the acknowledgement and the the praise because they were all all three of them were just amazing. But yeah, that God of War DLC, wow. Went deeper into Kratos' story and I still don't know what the ending means. And I'm going to be dwelling on that until we find out more about what's coming next from them. But <laughs> I'm here for it. So, without further ado, guys, let's get into this. All right, coming in at number 16, we've got the Lord of the Rings Gollum. Now, there's no prizes for guessing why this game has come dead last. Anyone who actually watched us play it or has played it themselves when it launched will already know the reasons why this is dead last. Just absolutely not what I expected at all when I played this game. Some of the mechanics in it was just completely broken. Like, I'll use the, the obvious example, that wall run mechanic. And you die to, like, the most random things. It was just a complete mess. Now, fun fact... <coughs> I was the 11th recorded person in the world on PSN profiles to get the trophy for completing the entire game without dying once. Yes, that is right. Little old me who just sits here and makes videos of me playing through games. I'm not a speedrunner. I'm not like a challenge YouTuber or anything like that. I'm just me. I'm just a regular player. And that says it all really that probably about 50 people ended up buying this game because I ended up being the 11th to get one of the trophies. So, yeah. The Lord of the Rings Gollum, 16th. Alright, at number 15 we've got Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. A bit of an awkward place to put this one, because overall with the multiplayer and the zombies included, I think this game would have been a bit higher in the list. But I'm only really counting the single player campaign, because I, I, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a weird one to have COD in, but I do feel like it needed to be in. Um... But to be honest, I don't really have a lot to say. It's It was a pretty solid COD campaign. And, well, while I'm on the topic of the online side anyway, I think that this is one of the best Call of Duties that we've had in years. And go and watch me TikToks if you want to see more of me playing that because that's where I post my multiplayer games at. But yeah, number 15 for Modern Warfare 3. And that's more just because of the fact that everything else on this list is just better. At number 14, we've got Lords of the Fallen. Dear me, where do we start with this one? It's another one of them games where if you saw us play it, you'd know why it's in this position. But for anyone who didn't, it was just a complete mess. When I played Lords of the Fallen, the performance was absolutely shocking. I was getting constant drops in frame rate, um, particularly in certain parts of the game. In some places, it was bordering on unplayable. Um, and a lot of the time, that led to me dying through no fault of my own, just literally because the game wasn't holding up. Um, the multiplayer features didn't work, and when they did, it was only the host that had a good connection. The player who joined, they were lagging and everything was delayed. Like, Because I remember joining people's games, and I'd like get hit by a boss, and I wouldn't feel the hit until a couple of seconds later. I thought I'd like swung and hit them, and then I'd end up losing health or like dying. It was unbelievable. Um, and I only ended up platinum in this game last week. But the multiplayer was still having issues then. So that's two months past release and it's still not working properly. And I think when they called it the first true next-gen Souls-like, that was both hilarious and 
an insult to a game that's much higher up in this list. So yeah, Lords of the Fallen, 14th. At number 13, we've got Warlong, Fallen Dynasty. So we've got back-to-back Souls-like games here. But this one I actually quite enjoyed, and it wasn't filled with performance issues, so I instantly gave it bonus points. Um, quite similar to Modern Warfare 3 here, where it's in a bit of an awkward position, but other games were just better than it. So it's not really a slight against the game. Um, and especially when you compare it to the Souls-like that is further up in this list, and I think most of you know what it is anyway. Um, but yeah, Warlong was a pretty good game. Um, it never felt too hard and it never felt too easy either. And I think that's what a Souls like should be or strives to be. Um, I love the atmosphere and the setting of it. I just thought all of that was great. Like I really did enjoy the game. So yeah, not really much more to say on that. Warlong, 13th. Coming in at 12, we've got Atlas Fallen. Now this and Warlong probably could have swapped around. I just gave Atlas Fallen the edge. Um... But in the nicest way possible, this was a pretty forgettable game. I mean, for starters, it, it released in August. And you tell me an elite game that's released in August in the past because I can't remember any off the top of my head. Um, but the game was actually pretty fun. Like, some of the mechanics were really good to use. But one thing I always struggled getting to grips with was the combat. I don't know what it was. I just could never, ever get, like... I just couldn't flow with it. Um... So yeah, to be honest, it, it kind of just felt like a bit of a filler game over the summer while we were waiting for some of the games that you'll see that are coming up. So, Atlas Fallen, 12th place. All right, sitting in 11th, we've got Dead Island 2. So just missing out on the top 10. And this is one of the games that I really enjoyed this year. It was a miracle in itself that we even got it. So I think that was probably one of the reasons why I did enjoy it so much because... We probably shouldn't even have had this game with all the development hell that it went through. But, yeah, not really a lot to say on this one either, except that it was it was really fun. Um, it wasn't too long, and I enjoyed the side quests and all the other optional stuff that was in there. Um, co-op was nice, like a nice little touch. It was fun to, to play with your mates and stuff, but really it's just your bog-standard zombie hack and slash. But I think one of the biggest things with this game was that you could tell that it should have been released like a decade ago. It did feel like that like 2013, <laughs> early early 2010s style game. But yeah, still, Dead Island sitting in 11th. Coming in at number 10, we've got Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. All right, we made it into the top 10. And it's my most recent playthrough that finds itself here. So at least I can't be accused of recency bias. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with this game. It's more the fact that it's just a complete reskin of pretty much any Far Cry game. Like, if they'd have changed the names of everything in this game to non-Avatar stuff and all the characters weren't blue, this could have easily been mistaken for the next Far Cry entry into the franchise. The side stuff wasn't really that interesting, and without needing to do some of it to get, like, me power level up and stuff, I probably wouldn't have chosen to do most of it. And that is very rare for me. A lot of you guys will know that I'm very thorough in games and I do like to do side stuff. But the one, like, the side quests in Avatar were just not hitting for me. Um, I guess I was just expecting a bit more from this game and didn't really get it. So I think this position is justified. Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora, 10th. At number 9, we've got Star Wars Jedi Survivor. One of the earlier games that I played on my channel this year, but a very good one at that, even with some of the performance issues that it had. Again, going back to that point, that even a game, when it has performance issues, can still be carried by other things. And I definitely think this game was... Everything else was just so good. It's just such a shame that at launch, it had its issues. I'll never forget going into that lift on Coruscant and it making me game crash every single time. I think I tried it like three times and after that i'd gave up because it made me game crash every single time um i just had to wait until they patched it um but things were just bigger and better than the first game in this one and that's exactly what you want from a sequel the side stuff was really good like going after all the bounty targets or fighting all the legendary enemies and i enjoyed going for all the collectibles when i was going for the platinum this game definitely earned its spot and it's just a case that the other eight games that are coming up are just better in my opinion so yeah, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, ninth. All right, in eighth, we've got Final Fantasy 16. Now this is where the list starts getting serious. 
and I can see this one being a bit of a controversial one, but please remember that this is just my opinion before you start aggressively typing and calling us all sorts. Now, I do think this game is a little bit overrated, but it's such a massive franchise, so it's going to have that major core of people that absolutely love it and think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But outside of the epic boss fights, which were absolutely epic, don't get me wrong, um, this game had some serious lows. It was like a 40-ish hour story, and about 15 to 20 hours of that was made up of cutscenes. And that's literally not even a joke either, like, that's the God's honest truth. Now, I'm not saying that's totally a bad thing, as cutscenes can be great in games, but some of them were literally that long that my controller actually died from inactivity, and that's never happened to me before when I've been playing a game. The side quests in the game were absolutely shocking until towards the end, when they decided to throw about 50 of them at you right before you were about to finish the main story and they completely broke up the pacing of the game. It's like, oh, what's that? Ultima needs to be stopped. The entire world's in danger. Well, yeah, hang on a minute, mate. I've just got to go and do 10 fetch quests and a bunch of other side quests that'll take us four hours. It was a good game, but I don't think it was as good as people were making out to be with the Game of the Year shouts. So, Final Fantasy 16, eighth. Sitting in seventh, we've got Hogwarts Legacy. Now, I'm even a little bit surprised myself with this one, but what a little beauty this game was. I actually think that it's quite underrated, as I've never really seen it talked about that much, but I do think that's also because of the matters outside of the game um, that surrounded it all the way until release and afterwards, but I loved Hogwarts Legacy. The story was great and all the side stuff was just as good. Like It kept us engaged all the way throughout, and I think that it had a level of consistency I'm not even the biggest Harry Potter fan and I love the game. So I just know that some of you guys out there were in your element with this game and good on yous. Um, and this game will always be remembered by me because it's the one that started us on this YouTube journey. It seems like longer than 10 months ago that I played it, but time flies when you're having fun, they say. It certainly has been. But yeah, I'm happy with the placement for this one. Hogwarts Legacy, 7th. Coming in at number 6, we've got the Resident Evil 4 remake. Now... I might get pelters for this one because I said I wasn't including the Phantom Liberty expansion, but then I've gone and included a remake. Does that count? Is that the same? Well, I think it's fair. Um, also, another thing to consider was that I'd never actually played the original Resident Evil 4 on the GameCube slash PS2. So this was like a brand new release for me anyway. And they changed some stuff from the original game. So it was good enough for me to put it in here. I think it's justified. But wow, what a game. I fully understood why this was regarded as one of the best video games in history. It isn't in my opinion, but I totally get where it comes from. Because this game is an absolute masterpiece. And it's definitely the best Resident Evil game I've played out of them all. Um, the story, the gameplay, the atmosphere. Leon Kennedy, unbelievable. What an incredible game. And it had great replayability as well. Um... And I think it was very unlucky to miss out on me top five. So yeah, Resident Evil 4 Remake, sixth place. In number five, we've got Starfield. Right, we're into me top five now. And this is probably another controversial one, but for reasons that I just can't fathom, to be honest. Um, this has got to be the most overhated game in the history of video games. And I'm not even exaggerating there. I honestly can't remember anything else going under the microscope like this game did. But one of the clear reasons for that was definitely the console exclusivity. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you're arguing over which console is better than the other, you need to just grow up. Just let people enjoy whatever console it is that they prefer to play on. It's that simple. Now, this game was right up my alley. And you guys already know, or if it wasn't glaringly obvious by me profile picture... I'm a massive fan of Bethesda's work. I was sold on this game from day one when I knew it was basically just going to be Skyrim in space. But they took everything that they did in their previous games and they made improvements on everything. And I feel like it's the cool thing to say that you don't like Starfield, but I really couldn't give a... Um, the game's class, and it was going to be my game of the year at the start of September... Then these four absolute units came out and knocked it back to you. So, unfortunately, Starfield fifth. At number four, we've got Assassin's Creed Mirage. The game that just missed out, but through no fault of its own, 
Um, I fully expected to love this game when it released and I was not let down. I couldn't have been happy yet to see this game do so well with the rough patch that the Assassin's Creed franchise has been going through over the last few years. Ubisoft were asked to take things back to basics and to return to the game's roots, like more like action-adventure instead of this RPG format they'd been going for recently, and do that they did. Mirage was kind of a masterpiece, I think, with that throwback feeling of Assassin's Creed 1 all the way back in 2007, mixed in with the stunning setting of Baghdad and the story of Basim, like they really struck gold with this one, I thought. The gameplay was great, the story was great as well. Um, I appreciated all the little nods back to the original, things like the notoriety posters, the eavesdropping, all that stuff. Um, it was just an excellent addition into the already incredible franchise. So, yep, Assassin's Creed Mirage, fourth. At number three, we've got Spider-Man 2. Time for the podium now, and wow, 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 wow. What a game we've got at number three. I thought Spider-Man PS4... And Spider-Man, Miles Morales were good, but this game absolutely blew the both of them out of the water. The story was class with all the villains, but Craven and Venom in particular, quality. Um, Venom's one of my favourite characters, so to see him have such a massive part in this game was so good. The gameplay was immense with all the new abilities for each Spider-Man. Um, all of the new suits and all the side content was fantastic as well, like the, the Marcos memories, the Flame uh, missions, and the Howard mission, even though it was really, really sad. No spoilers. Um, one of the greatest compliments I could give this game is that you could be playing it for an hour and you'll have done absolutely nothing because you've just been swinging around New York or gliding around because the traversal in the game is just so much fun and so smooth. Um the only downer I am going to put on this is that it's still not the best superhero game of all time, but that's neither here nor there. Spider-Man 2, third, and sitting in second place is Lies of P. Just narrowly missing out on the top spot is the best Souls-like game that I've ever played, and an instant classic in its own right. This game did something to me. I was absolutely hooked from the demo that we got all the way back in like June, I think it was, but... Did anyone really expect it to be as good as it was when the full game came out? I mean, what a masterpiece in every sense of the word. The story, the lore, the world and everything in it, um, the gameplay, the, the soundtrack, um, the little teaser at the end, which I won't spoil, phenomenal. Um, that song, Fascination, from when you fight the white lady on the stage um, and then a little later on it's playing through the loudspeakers in Rosa Isabel Street. That lives in my head to this day. It is absolutely beautiful. I love the soundtrack to this game. Um, and this was one that I played in full at least three times on the way again in the Platinum, and it never once felt like a chore at all, which was the complete opposite to Lords of the Fallen, where it felt like I was forcing myself to play the game just so I could get the Platinum, and it took us well over 100 hours to get it. Um, this game was so close to being my game of the year and honestly it was pretty much a toss up so Lies of P second and coming in at the top spot we've got Alan Wake 2 and my 2023 game of the year is Alan Wake 2 and I think a lot of you knew this was coming anyone that watched me play it anyway I mean it was just an incredible experience all round it dared to be different and it set itself aside from all the other games on this list. There was no guarantee that what Remedy did with this would land. They took a massive risk on it, but boy, did it pay off. The story was absolutely mind-boggling at times, and it always had you guessing. Um, the gameplay was so much more improved from Alan Wake 1, um, and it somehow managed to strike a balance between being scary and having you on the edge of your seat but then being able to make you laugh by sticking one of them Coscular Brothers ads on the TV in between all the terror. It's just a game that will live long in the memory, especially that musical scene with that Herald of Darkness song that is stuck in my head just like that fascination from Lies of P. And something else to consider as well for why this was my game of the year. Alan Wake 1 was good, but if you'd have asked us months ago before it came out if I thought this was going to be game of the year based off everything that I knew, and had experienced from the first game absolutely no chance. I'd have told you it had just been a good game, and I was looking forward to it. 
and it absolutely blew my expectations away. Unbelievable. Fully deserved. So congratulations to Remedy and anyone who was involved in the creation of Alan Wake 2 because you brought us an absolute masterpiece and you fully deserved all the awards that you won. So there it is, guys. Every game that I played in 2023, ranked from worst to best, I ended up getting the platinum for 13 of them, which is pretty good going. Um, the only ones that I don't have is Modern Warfare 3. That's because it doesn't have a platinum trophy. Uh, Starfield, because I played that on Steam. And Avatar, which I'm working on now in my spare time. And I think something to consider as well with me absolutely loving my platinum trophies is that by going for them, I end up putting in a lot more hours than the average player does. So I'd like to think that that can help us justify my decisions on where I've ranked all these games at because I've seen a lot more of these games than the majority of people. But anyway, please let us know what you thought of this video, guys, because honestly, I worked so hard on making this. So please don't break me heart in the comments. Please be nice. I'm not a graphic designer and I'm not a professional video editor. I've tried my best and this is what it's came out as. But especially please be nice to each other if you have different opinions in the comments because... Video games wouldn't be what they are if everyone thought the same and liked and disliked the same things. It just wouldn't be what it is. The variety we've got, that's what makes it so great. Now, if you're ever going to like and subscribe because of one of my videos, please make it be this one. Even if it's just out of pity or for the effort that I've put in, please do drop it a like. But all jokes aside, guys, I want to wish each and every one of you all the very best for 2024. Maybe this will be the year that you take up that hobby you were thinking about or you might apply for that new job or who knows, you might finally create that YouTube channel you've always wanted to do. That's what I did pretty much this time last year. The only person who can stop you is yourself and you want to get rid of any negativity that you might have around you and I struggled with this for a long time, caring too much about what people thought until one day something happened in my life and it just made things like that seem so insignificant. Just thought, why do I even care about things like this? There's there's much bigger things going on in life to, to be worrying about what someone thinks about me. And honestly, guys, it's the best thing that you can ever do. Anyone who's struggling with things like that, I've been there. You just need to let go, let just get rid of it. Don't don't let anyone get to you. Whatever anyone says, just block it out. It doesn't matter. The only person who's it there should be some people in the life who you really care about their opinion and it's your your loved ones. And other than that, Things that other people say, yeah, it should just be like water off a duck's back. Just do not let it get to you whatsoever. And maybe I'll get into that thing that happened to me one day because that is the reason that I'm here doing what I do. But that thing happened in my life and it just made everything just, fl all, my, all my worries and everything just sort of floated away. And I just didn't think about things like that anymore. So whatever it might be that you go for in 2024, guys, I hope you just grab it with both hands, go all in, do it. A quote that springs to mind is Heath Ledger's Bjorker in The Dark Knight when he said, if you're good at something, never do it for free. And that is great career advice. So if you have made it this far, guys, I just want to thank you so much for watching once again. And if you've watched any of my videos in 2023, thank you for that. I really do appreciate it and it does not go unnoticed. I'm so grateful that you guys are coming here to watch me play games and I can't, I'll never ever be able to fathom it. Um... I just feel so privileged that that you guys choose to give your time to me. I, I couldn't ask any more of you. I, I just want to thank you so much. I really, really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, you guys know who you are, the ones who keep coming back. Um, it's been an amazing 10 months really so far. And I couldn't have asked for nicer people to be subscribed to me and the ones who interact with me. You are all so wonderful. You are so kind. And honestly, you are just such good people. I couldn't ask for more. You're the exact type of audience that I wanted. Um, and hopefully we get some more in. I'd, I'd love to keep growing and seeing what we can do. But I think my next milestone now is one year on YouTube, like as in uploading, which will be February the 7th. That was when I uploaded my first Hogwarts Legacy video. Um, so we'll have to think about what we can do for that. Um, I'll have a think. But, yeah, might put it to a poll or something. I don't know. I'll have, I'll have a think. But, no, honestly, guys, I just I can't thank you enough. I'm, I'm so appreciative of everything, and I'm so grateful that you even choose to give up, like, one minute of your day to me. It's Time is the most valuable thing in the world, and the fact that you guys want to give it to me, 
I just want to thank you so much. I, I, I really can't, I can't say anymore. You're just amazing. So I know we're into 2024 now, but this technically should have been the last video of 2023. So this is technically me signing off from 2023, guys. So once again, I just want to wish you all the very best for the new year. Um, I hope you achieve everything that you set out to do. I believe in you. You can do it. Go do it. I believe in you. So please do drop a like on the video, guys. Please subscribe if you're new around here and you like what you see. Go and check out all my other videos. They're just going to keep coming. We are not stopping. We're not slowing down. Nothing like that. The work rate stays. It's If anything, it's going harder this year. Um, and other than that, guys, I hope wherever you all are, you are having a wonderful day. And I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.